All right, let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Bridging Histology and Genomics with Visium Spatial Profiling Data Analysis Tutorial. My name is Jacqueline Smiler, and I'm a sales executive with 10X Genomics, supporting Connecticut and the New York City areas. And today I'm excited um, because we are, I, I'm here today to showcase some of uh, 10X in terms of Visium, but as well as our Chromium and Xenium platforms as well. I also have with me today um, for the webinar, Jan Van Robes, a PhD candidate in the Ted Abel Lab at the University of Iowa. And Jan is here to present on sleep deprivation, specifically what are the cellular and molecular consequences of sleep deprivation, which he used uh, Visium spatial transcriptomics and single cell RNA-seq to, uh, to dive deeper into this question. I also have Xiaowen Wang here, a field application scientist with Partech. Shawn's been uh, with Partech support team for more than 20 years, and she's helped over thousands of scientists analyze and interpret their data. Shawn's here to give us a one hour long tutorial, or sorry, about a 30 to 45 minute long tutorial um, on how to analyze Visium data using their point and click interface, Partech Flow. And as a thank you for attending our webinar today, we're happy to announce that Partech is giving away one month free access to Partech Flow. Um, and so you can type in this promo code spatial underscore and with today's date on their website um, to unlock the free trial. And we'll also post this information in the chat as well um, so that you um, can be able to, oh, I already got a question. So we'll, I'll get to that question in a moment, uh, Jeanette, probably around the end of the, uh, at the end of my talk. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick off the, the talk and let's go ahead. So Xiaon and um, Jan, if you go ahead and just turn off your uh, screens, thank you. All right. All right, so here at 10X, we recognize that there is a wide variety of biological questions and sample types. And so our ultimate goal is to develop a portfolio of products to help answer the questions you have. And so our motivation and mission at 10X is to build the tools to help you all unravel the complexities of biology. And we do this across three technology platforms with single cell uh, for called our chromium platform to interrogate the whole transcriptome and epigenome, as well as other analytes from single cells. We also have uh, Visium, which is our spatial transcriptomics platform to be able to ask where is the gene expression located in the context of your tissue section. Um, and so these are our unbiased whole transcriptome analysis uh, efforts. But then our latest in situ platform, Xenium, provi provides extremely high resolution single cell information with spatial localization from a targeted panel of genes. And so at 10x, we focus not just on an individual assays, but on entire platforms. So when researchers make an investment in any one of these uh, platforms, please do know that we're going to continue to develop and innovate on them, right? And so if you just take a look, since the launch of uh, single cell gene expression in 2016 on our Chromium platform, we've continued to expand and build out capabilities to be able to measure different analytes from a single cell. And we've done that now with Visium, with, uh, Visium with immunofluorescence, then compatibility with FFP tissues, and then Cytosis, and now Xenium with our latest instrumentation launch at the end of this year. And so when we think of 10X, we think of the portfolio where data can be interchanged and used to drive greater insights. And so we can start by running our tools in parallel and using pre-existing single cell RNA-seq data to deconvolute your Visium data by combining these two um, data sets. And so this will ultimately enable you to level up your insights, right? And so you'll be able to refine cell atlases, discover new cell types with anatomical location and characterize tissue cell architecture across development and disease states. And so now, excitingly, we have ways to combine this from serial sections from the same sample with FFP tissue sections. And so here we bring together chromium fixed RNA profiling, single cell analysis, and Visium spatial transcriptomics analysis. And we leverage the shared whole transcriptome probes from the same FFP tissue block, and we're also using the same analysis tool sets. So everything's available online, and this allows us to tell a really, really nice story from the same tissue section, right, by combining both uh, gene expression and spatial from the same tissue block. And so in a customer-developed protocol called SM PathoSeq, 
the authors took sections from the same FFP tissue block and isolated single nuclei from a few sections and then also performed visium FFP on another section. And it's important to highlight that working with FFP samples is extremely challenging. And in this case, they're working with archived breast cancer liver metastasis that was collected during an autopsy. And so they collected more than four hours after the death of the patient. So RNA after that is already starting to degrade. And then RNA further degrades just by doing FFP treatment. And then because they're working with liver, this is also challenging, right? Because liver is moderately rich in RNases. And so what's really exciting with this new probe design with our chromium fixed RNA profiling assay is that it's extremely sensitive. And so the plot on the left here shows the UMI counts for gene for Visium versus fixed RNA profiling. And you can see that we have a strong correlation between these two assays, validating that the data we're capturing is reflective of biology. And then the plot on the right shows the population of cells found in each assay. And again, showing that there's a very close similarity between the two. And so the main takeaway from combining either fixed RNA profiling with Visium is that you're going to detect similar cell types and similar complexity, indicating that compatibly between these two assays. And SN PathoSeq with fixed RNA profiling can generate high quality complex data sets from archived tissue, but it can also detect lowly expressed markers like the estrogen receptor one um, gene. And so this is really compelling and, and it's really the new standard. So we are now seeing that our new fixed RNA profiling assay is um, can deliver twice as more genes than three prime. And so on the right-hand side, we're looking at the reads mapped against um, the, the transcriptome. And on the y-axis is the median genes per cell. And the bottom axis is the sequencing depth. And so as you can see that with fixed RNA profiling in the dark blue, that we're actually getting double the number of genes per cell um, at the same sequencing depth. And this is really important, right? Because at this um, sequencing depth now, we're actually decreasing the sequencing cost by 50%. And additionally, you can also detect lowly expressed genes, including transcription factors like FOXA1 and TP53. And so when we think of how single cell and Visium can be combined, here's an example of how all three platforms come together synergistically when studying the tumor microenvironment. So here, when we have um, serial sections of FFP tissue sections, we ran it with um, the chromium fixed RNA profiling on the top, the um, Visium assay in the middle, and this is using our latest instrument for Visium called the Cytosyst, which I'll get into a little bit later. And then on the bottom is the Xenium analyzer. So what we did is we used the Visium and the fixed RNA uh, profiling data. We were able to identify 313 genes to profile at subcellular resolution with Xenium. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at genes of interest that then we are developing probes to design against with using Xenium in C2 sequencing. And these genes covered a wide variety of cell types and allowed us to deeply characterize cell type composition. Xenium has extremely high resolution and throughput. So with each capture area that you're running on Xenium, it's 12 by 24 millimeters and the runtime only takes two days. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into super depth about this preprint, but it's ex really, really exciting. So we hope that you take a screenshot of this um, and then um, you know, do a deeper dive and, and see what we actually found. But ultimately the main takeaways from this preprint is that we're able to learn more than what with having all three platforms than what you could do just with one method on its own. Um, and so this is really just showing the power of combining you know, our uh, tool clicks. And so another really exciting thing to point out about um, Xenium and how all of our uh, platforms combine is that the tissue is still um, intact after running Xenium, which means you can do immunofluorescence staining on the tissue, you can do HME staining, and even cooler is that you can run Visium because this new site assist instrument we have allows you to use standard slides as input. Um, so now you can do a targeted in situ approach on an FFP tissue section and then take that same exact section and run it at the whole transcriptome on the cytosyst. So I'm really excited and I'll, I'm gonna go into the cytosyst a little bit later um, and, and shed more light onto how that works. 
So really just to highlight about Xenium, um, you know, we do have uh, interactive data sets online today. Um, so the first panels that we have available are for mouse brain as well as human breast. And you can dive into the uh, data um, if you would like on our website. And this QR code here will take you to our landing page for Xenium. Um, and I'll also post all these links in the, in the chat so you can access them as well as if I'm moving too fast to take a picture of these um, QR codes. Um, but another exciting thing I wanted to mention is that Partech will also be making an announcement specifically about Xenium um, today as well. So we're all here to focus on uh, Visium, but you know, although we are here to talk about Visium, I did like to highlight how everything fits in together, but for the remainder of this talk, I'm just gonna go really deep into how Visium works um, and kind of you know, give some insight onto that. So our Visium platform leads the way in spatial biology. This is exemplified by the number of institutions that are using our Visium products, and two is the productive, sorry, productivity of the researchers at these institutions, right? And so we can see that in the number of publications and preprints that are coming out um, every year, and it's continuing to grow exponentially. And so let's get into how Visium works and what's the really the power of Visium. So ultimately. Visium combines two types of information. It's the histology image from the microscope and the gene expression data from sequencing. And really the power of Visium is how these two data sets are combined. So by overlaying the Visium with the morphology, you're gonna be able to see a lot more than you could ever before with just taking h &E staining of your tissue. And so with Visium, you have two different types of options. You can do h &E staining, like in this example here on a breast cancer tissue sample, and this will allow you to get the morphological context. So when you start with Visium, you're gonna take a section and stain your tissues and then take an image of them. And so in this example, the pathologist was asked to annotate the section. And so we can see here that they identified seven uh, distinct tissue type categories. And so now when we do a differential gene expression analysis in Loop Browser, we can ask, what is the difference between the areas that the pathologist annotated versus what are we seeing in terms of gene expression? And especially what genes are upregulated in this carcinoma, right? And so if we look at the results and we look at what the pathologist annotated versus what are the genes upregulated in this cluster, we could just do a simple Google search on these top genes, right? And then pull out. So for example, S. Uh, CGB2A2, that expression is highly specific in mammary tissue and is increasingly used for identification and detection of disseminated breast cancer cells. Um, and then we also highlighted TFF1, which is a gene known to be upregulated in breast carcinoma. And really, this is just the beginning. So if you are an expert in the field, um, specifically in breast cancer, you know, you can completely go through these genes that are upregulated and then really dive deep and investigate and interrogate the tissue that you're studying. So I also mentioned, so you have h &E staining that you can do with Visium, but you also now have the ability to do immunofluorescence. And so what this is showing here is that Visium gene expression is being overlaid on top of a, a immunofluorescence image of mouse brain. And so on the left-hand side, we are seeing spot clusters representing gene expression. Um, and so we're seeing clusters one through nine have all different colors. And so if you're familiar with single cell RNA-seq analysis, each color represents a different gene expression profile. And so um, cells in this cluster that have similar gene expression profiles are gonna be categorized unbiasedly and um, given a distinct color. And then on the right, if you want, you can specifically choose regions of interest um, in the analysis software. So here we're showing um, the use of our lasso tool to highlight the hippocampus region of the mouse brain. And so the beauty of Visium though, is you're able to start with the whole you know, mouse uh, half of the, the brain hemisphere and then dive deeper into specific regions that you wanna interrogate. And so with the um, combination of immunofluorescence, you're able to look up to six different colors at a time. Um, and so here we're looking at uh, DAPI uh, markers for nuclei, NUN for uh, neurons, and then GFAP, which is a biomarker for astroglial injury. Um, and so you can toggle um, to see however way you want with like selecting on DAPI, NUN, or GFAP all at once, or however way it makes sense for you to, to better analyze the data. 
So after thinking about whether you want to do HNE staining or immunofluorescence staining, really the next step is talking about like really what are you trying to find out with with Visium, right? And so I just wanted to go through a few examples of what you can do. With the first being cell atlasing. So this you can take Visium and you can characterize, identify, and catalog tissue while maintaining spatiality. Another is doing a comparison study. So looking at differences between normal and disease tissue. You could also do spatial temporal analysis. So you track cell populations and gene expression patterns over time and disease progression. And then finally, you can uncover novel uh, biomarkers and gene signatures of cellular and disease processes. And so after you think about what you're going to study, if you're rather do h and or immunofluorescence, you also have to think about what is your tissue type that you're starting with. And depending on what assay you run with, you're gonna have different um, types of uh, protocols that you're going to be following. Um, and it's also important to consider your experimental goals as well. So with Visium, you have two different types of tissue types that are compatible. The first being fresh frozen um, blocks that are embedded in optimal cutting temperature or OCT. Um, and this uses a poly A based capture method. So it's species agnostic. It uses a very similar um, capture method that we use for three prime. And then we also have FFP uh, tissues that can be used. And this uses a probe based method. And so we have uh, probes designed against the whole transcriptome in human and the whole transcriptome in mouse. Um, so it's really important to consider, you know, if you don't have human or mouse, samples for FFP, you know, then you would most likely want to go with fresh frozen, right? Because that's available for a wide range of species. Um, another great thing is that because we are using probes for FFP, we continue to develop and build on them. So with um, the new CytoSyst instrument, we actually released a new probe set for uh, humans. Um, and this allows us to have three fold coverage for lowly expressed genes, increasing the sensitivity for the assay. And so I just want to keep going through and briefly highlight um, how the workflow looks. I do see stuff coming in the Q&A, but for uh, time's sake, I, I think I'll just answer them at the end. Um, so with um, Visium, we have to kind of think about it in a new way because we have this new cytosis. So with the manual workflow, we consider it to be like the direct placement method. And so when we call it direct placement, it's in the name, right? So you're going to section your tissue and get it directly onto the Visium slide. So sectioning uh, the fresh frozen with either the cryostat or the FFP with the microtome, and then mounting that tissue onto our Visium capture slide. Next, the Visium slide will then be taken down to the next steps for uh, H&E staining or immunofluorescence. Um, and then you'll have to image that tissue and get a high resolution picture so that you can use it in the data analysis. And so like those images that I was showing before with um, Loop Browser, that's those images being overlaid. So you wanna have a nice image so that your data will look nice when you, you go to do the analysis. Um, after you do imaging, next on the slide, we're actually doing a permeabilization step. So we're poking holes in the cells to release all the RNA. And this is what's going to be captured on the Visium slide. And then we're going to do a cDNA synthesis, amplification steps, and then library construction. Um, after library construction, we're then going to sequence the samples and then take it to our Space Ranger analysis pipeline um, and then Loop Browser, which is going to let you visualize your data. Um, and so this slide shows the key of the Visium technology for the direct placement workflow. Um, and as you can see on the left hand side, each Visium slide has four capture areas. The capture area size is 6.5 by 6.5 millimeters. And each slide has about 5,000 barcoded spots um, that are present per capture array. And here are represented by different color uh, dots to represent each spot. And then if we look at each spot more closely, we can see that it's made up of a million of these probes on the right that contain very specific barcode sequences. The one of probably the most important is the spatial barcode. And this is going to serve as the coordinates for where your transcripts came from um, on the glass slide. And then you have a unique molecular identifier that's going to count each transcript. So this is gonna be unique to each single one of these oligos. Um, and so with the, uh, the fresh frozen assay, the poly DT primer on there is going to allow for a direct capture of the poly A tail of your mRNA transcripts. But when we're using the um, FFP assay, we're doing a probe based method, 
right? And so we are actually developing probes that have uh, synthetic polyatails, and that's what's going to be captured with these polyDT primers on the slide. So the slides are manufactured the same. It's really the underlying chemistry that differs. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight how the probes work for FFP. Um, and so on the top, we're seeing a left-handed probe and a right-handed probe. Um, the right-handed probe has that synthetic poly A tail. And so essentially what we're doing is before going into um, the, the permeabilization step is we're hybridizing these probes to our target mRNA. And so we hybridize them, they ligate to one another, and then we're gonna digest the target mRNA, leaving behind the surrogate that's going to have this synthetic poly A tail. And ultimately that's what's gonna get captured with the Visium slide. And so as we remember, these probes are designed against the human and the mouse transcriptome, but it's, um, we do have uh, these probes list online. And so we're excluding specific probes that could potentially like take up room in your sequencing data like mitochondrial ribosomal, but some other probes are excluded as well like viruses and bacterias. So importantly though, is that you can generate custom probes now to spike into the Visium assay. This is not officially supported by 10X, but we do see researchers out in the field doing this. For example, um, here's the latest preprint where they utilize custom uh, COVID probes during their Visium uh, FFP assay. And so this is really exciting um, and I'll post this in the chat, but now you can get viral uh, detection from um, Visium FFP. And then ad additionally, there's another uh, method out in the field called spatial total RNA sequencing that allows you to capture both ATAIL and non-ATAIL transcriptome. Um, and so what it's doing is in situ polyadenylation. And so the authors applied this STRS method to study the regeneration of skeletal muscle after injury and the pathogenesis of viral induced myocarditis. And as in the Visium method, the sample is sectioned and then fixed with methanol and then stained for histology. And then after the imaging, the sample is rehydrated and then incubated with a yeast poly A polymerase. And this adds a poly A tail to the three prime end of the RNA so that the endogenous poly A tails are extended and then the non A tail transcripts are polyadenylated. So this not only one lets you capture non-coding RNAs, it also lets you capture newly transcribed RNAs and viral RNAs. So this is really exciting. And I quoted this um, line straight from the paper that it's ultimately a straightforward and uh, way to implement this method and it adds minimal cost and time to an already widely used commercial available workflow. And so they also tested this out with viral myo myocardias data, which allowed them to directly compare cell type abundance with viral RNA levels. Um, and so now they're looking at spatial resolved virus host interactions. Um, and so when we think back to the 10X Genomics Innovation Engine, you know, our end users are also part of this. And we encourage you all to continue to tinker and innovate to make our products and technologies work better for you to interrogate your samples. All right, so now I'm gonna pivot and discuss sample prep considerations. And first let's start with fresh frozen sample prep. Um, so when you're working with fresh frozen, each sample is unique and it's critical to optimize the permeabilization conditions for um, fresh frozen. Um, and what we do to optimize this is called the tissue optimization experiment. And ultimately what you're doing is um, sectioning the same tissue section. So just taking serial sections with our Visium optimization slide, it has eight different capture areas for you to be able to visualize how much cDNA you're actually able to get out of each tissue section. Um, and so if we blow this image up and just take a closer look, um, it's clear to us that at 30 minutes time, we're seeing the least amount of diffusion um, and the sharpest image. And that's how we would know that 30 minutes is the best permeabilization time to then take forward into the real Visium assay. Um, so this is really important consideration before you even get started uh, with the real experiment. Another thing to uh, think about is tissue placement. So because this is a direct placement method, you wanna practice getting those tissue sections into the capture areas of your slide. And you don't wanna cover the fiducial frame either because that's really important for the data analysis um, portion. And then additionally, it's also important to take into consideration how um, good is the RNA from your tissue block. So we recommend checking the RNA um, using the RIN score. And we have recommendations of having a RIN score greater than seven, um, but this is not indicative of if you're going to have an ultimately successful library. So this is a merely a suggestion that we're, we 
are pretty sure you're going to get good results, but people are able to actually get really good results from RINs that have less than seven. So it's just kind of like our guidelines of what we hope for you to follow. And um, ultimately, if you're not sure if your sample type is going to be good, just reach out to our support team and we'll be able to walk you through um, any of our um, best practices and guides. So in addition to all of this information, all of this is online in terms of how-to videos and demonstrated protocols. So you can review all this on our website. And you also have a dedicated field application team, including tissue specialists and spatial science and technology advisors. So at 10X, we've expanded our team to help you more. And so, you know, please leverage us. And we are experts to be able to, you know, help plan your next experiment and be successful as well. Um, so that's Fresh Frozen. The next is FFP. So with FFP, we noticed that you don't actually have to adjust the permeabilization time for the tissue. So everything is kept at a constant time, which means that tissue optimization is not required. We also know that the RIN score is not predictive of the assay success. And so what we've um, designed is that going with the DV200 score. So this is the percentage of fragments that are greater than 200 base pairs. Um, and so what we recommend is that you have um, samples that have a DV200 of greater than 50%. But again, this is just our guidelines, right? So if you wanna try out a sample that has a lower DV200 score, we, we encourage that, right? If that's all you have, but and just a guideline to really be a nice indicator that your experiment's going to work. Again, please practice tissue placement and avoid um, covering the fiducial border. All right, so sample prep is incredibly important, but so is the logistics of running Visium, right? And the data is extremely powerful, but it, the Visium workflow, we, as we know, will expand different labs. Um, because you're going to have different experts in histology, um, and then you'll have experts in the molecular biology part for that spot of space. So then with the site assist, we've developed this instrument to help bridge the gap and learn even more. So essentially what Visi uh, the site assist is doing, it's giving you choice in four different ways. First, you can start with pre-section tissues on standard glass slides. You can work with archived tissue samples or freshly cut samples. Then you can identify the right sample of, um, to make sure that it's going to be what you want. So you can do h &E staining up front and then decide later if you want to proceed to Visium. Um, you also have the option to do uh, different tissue sizes now. So you can do 6.5 millimeter, or if you have a larger tissue to interrogate, you can do the 11 by 11 tissue capture size. And then finally, like the um, uh, standard direct capture method, you can also do h &E or aminofluorescence staining. And so with the site assist slide design, we've developed a, a new type of uh, capture area. So now we only have two capture areas per slide compared to four, but then we also have these new larger 11 by 11 capture areas. Um, and so with, with the increased capture area size, we also increased the number of barcode spots. But again, that the poly DT um, capture and the probe-based method is still the same, um, depending on like across the, the different slides for Visium site assist. And so what's important when you're interrogating larger tissue samples is that maybe now you don't have to score your tissue block or do a punch out, right, to fit into these 6.5 millimeter capture areas, which is shown here. So now you can profile three times the size of the tissue section, which is really nice, um, especially if you don't want to compromise your tissue block. But also the, be the, the real beauty is having the input of standard glass slides, right? So being able to use standard glass slides that maybe are archived somewhere in a drawer that you just been waiting to be analyzed can now be um, analyzing using the site assist. So I just wanted to highlight really quick how this works. So what you're doing is you're put, taking two tissue samples on standard glass slides, one of our Visium slides, either the 6.5 or the 11 millimeter capture areas. Both of these go into the site assist. Um, on the top are your standard glass slides. On the bottom is the Visium slide. And essentially what it's doing is it's controlling the permeabilization um, and automating that step. So it's going to basically be releasing those probes that were hybridized up front of Cytosis and pulling that down um, onto the Visium capture slide. Um, and so what's really important that we're automating the step is that we're able to improve the um, data quality that's coming out of Visium for FFP. So now we're actually able to move forward with FFP tissues with DV200s of 30% um, or more. And we also see improvements in terms of the fraction of reads under the tissue, um, the 
the number of usable reads as well as the overall spatiality. So the, the signal contained to the biological relevant areas. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, when you invest in one of our platforms, we continue to expand on them. And so um, here's what we're working on right now for Cytosyst. Um, I do have to say there's no official dates to be announced yet, but um, we're really, really excited. You know, we're working on ways to validate alternatives to xylene so that way you don't have to work in different areas of the lab. We'll also have guidance for tissue microarrays. Um, seeing the bone, I know that's really exciting for some people, um, as well as working with frozen tissues. So since Cybus is only FFP, we're working on making it compatible with frozen and then also fixed frozen, which I know a lot of people have um, doing that in their lab as well. So this is all just really, really exciting. Um, and so with the advice and support across the board from sample prep um, and uh, processing, you know, we continue to develop and, and build on all of these platforms. And we're really committed to maintaining, you know, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the analysis pipelines and, and working with uh, groups like Cortec to continue to like build out on what we can offer and really be partners along the way. Um, so I really thank everyone for their time. Um, and I have a bunch of questions in the chat and the Q&A. So I'm gonna get to those in just a moment. Um, so please bear with me and I'll also post in the chat, like all of those, um, the links for our website. Um, but next up, I am going to introduce Jan again. Um, so Jan, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and come on slide. There's Jan. All right, so Jan, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Jan's here um, to talk about his um, presentation titled Spatial Transcriptomics to Define Transcript transcriptional patterns of sleep deprivation in the mouse brain. So Jan, you should be able to just swap uh, screens with me. And you're you're still muted. Is this good like that? Yep, you're good. Awesome, Go ahead. thank you. Okay, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, First of all, thanks to uh, Tenix and, and Partech for allowing me to, to be here today and present my research. It's um, really exciting and a, and a great opportunity for me and, and my lab as well. Um, but yeah, today I will talk to you about um, how we use this uh, visual uh, spatial transcriptomic approach to answer some of our questions in a lab and um, especially how, uh, how sleep deprivation impacts uh, gene expression um, in the mouse brain. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, by the way, I'm Jan, uh, a fourth year uh, PhD student in genetics in uh, Tedebo Lab in the um, University of Iowa. So first of all, sleep um, is really important for multiple aspects of life. Um, it's been shown to increase um, its incidence for different uh, diseases like metabolic or cardiac diseases, um, also cancer. Uh, but in our lab, we were so interested in linking uh, sleep deprivation to uh, learning and memory. Um, and most of the time, we try to uh, mention some of the Alzheimer's disease as has been shown to um, sleep has been shown to increase its incident, and, but also its progression. Uh, in terms of number, um, the CDC uh, published recently that almost 35 percent of people don't get their seven hours of sleep every day. Uh, for the teenager, it's even more, it's about 70%, I think. Um, so really, really a lot of people that are being uh, sleep deprived um, chronically, um, but like usually when people think about sleep deprivation, they, they mostly are talking about chronic sleep deprivation. So multiple days in a row, you getting sleep deprived. Here in this study and, and today in, for this presentation, I will, uh, I will focus on acute sleep deprivation, which is um, just one night, uh, five hours of sleep deprivation for, for the mice. And so in my lab, we previously shown that this acute sleep deprivation, just one night is enough to impact um, uh, some uh, learning and memory tasks, such as the contextual fear conditioning, the object, um, special object recognition, the Maurice water maze. Um, um, of course, if we're talking about learning, uh, we also shown that it impacts the long-term potentiation and synaptic plasticity. And there are some evidence that uh, are suggesting uh, that it also affects the spine density and the, the, the type of spine. Um, 
but more into a molecular aspect of things, uh, we've also shown that acute state deprivation impacts the and inhibits the cyclic AMP and PKA signaling pathway, um, which result in a decrease of a uh, phosphorylated CREB, uh, which is a very famous uh, transcription factor um, that induce uh, transcription down, down the line. And so with those, uh, with those results, we have now this very big and interesting question, which is basically what are the cellular and molecular consequences of acute sleep deprivation? Um, and so to answer this question, there is a very easy and, 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 and nice way to do it. It's to do gene expression analysis, right? Uh, if you do uh, RNA-seq, for example, um, you can have, um, you can target all the genes and know after sleep deprivation, what are the genes that are up or down after sleep deprivation. Um, and so that's exactly what we've done last year. Um, we either sleep deprived the mice for five hours uh, or not. Um, and at that time, we were really focused on the hippocampus. Um, so we decided to do a bowel current seek from the whole hippocampus from mice that were either sleep deprived or not. Um, and the reason why we were focused on the hippocampus is because um, it, it is known to be the most sensitive region of the brain um, uh, towards uh, sleep deprivation. And also it's, it's a very important region of the brain for uh, memory and learning. And so we've done that. We got uh, a list of genes that were either downregulated in blue or upregulated in red. Um, and so the genes that were downregulated um, enriched specific pathways that were related to uh, some type of synaptic, synaptic functions, uh, cell adhesions, uh, dendrites, whereas the genes that were upregulated was uh, mostly related to genes um, that had functions inside the nucleus, such as RNA splicing and other uh, uh, mRNA processing. So that was great to know that sleep depression indeed uh, affect gene expression in the, in the hippocampus. But now we have a new, thanks to tenic genomics, we have new techniques and approach to, um, to, uh, to answer, uh, to have more answers, but also to bring more questions. Um, and so um, if we put this, this, uh, those different technologies in a 2D space. At the beginning, we had this bulk seek where um, all your gene expression data was um, just one dot in this 2D space because all your gene expression is averaged across your whole tissue. And so all, all the genes in the different cell types uh, would be averaged in, under one value, right? Um, but later on, we had this single cell seek data where you were able to um, cluster different cells based on uh, specific transcriptomic signatures, um, and then be able to run differential gene expression analysis in specific uh, cell types. And now, even more recently, we have this new spatial transcriptomic division that allows you to overlay the gene expression data on your tissue section directly. Um, and like, uh, like Jacqueline said previously, there's been a, 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 an increased number of papers every year that use this, this technique. And, um, really, this, this spatial transcriptomic is a very impactful uh, approach. It's been, it's been published in very high impact factor journals, um, and it's, it's, it's been working really great so far. Um, but the, the, the thing I want to point out is that most of people have used this technique um, mostly to characterize some tissues. Um, for example, here, they characterize different layers of the human dorsal, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, over here, this paper, they, they use the, this, this vision to um, characterize some uh, tumor macro environment, um, which is great. Uh, but here we wanted, um, what we wanted to do is uh, really to use this technique to be able to compare the slides together, uh, either the, the, the tissue that was uh, coming from sleep deprived mice against the, the tissue section that were coming from non sleep deprived mice. Um, and so why, I guess it's already been said a bit, but why would you choose vision? Well, um, for different reasons that, that Jacqueline also said previously, um, like, like in the name, um, it, it stands for uh, spatial information, but also with the whole transcriptomic data uh, associated with. Um, and so you're able to overlay your gene, gene expression data directly with your histolog histological uh, image uh, of your tissue section. Um, you won't have any dissociation biased uh, for your transcriptome analysis. Um, and you can also retain the, organiz the organization of your tissue and cellular microenvironment. And finally, if your uh, tissue is heterogeneous enough, you will be able to uh, have some type of uh, cell type identification. And that's also something I'll show you at the end of this uh, presentation. 
Um, so quickly, this this um, the workflow of vision. Um, Jacqueline, we went over it, but so I will guess. I guess I will be the, I will go a bit quicker on that. But we decided to do uh, to use sixteen animals. So eight mice were sleep deprived, and eight mice were non sleep deprived. And so from each animal, we took one coronal section. And you can actually fit half of a coronal section per square on those uh, slides. And so as you can see, you can fit uh, four uh, different sections for each slide. Um, and so the most um, interesting part here, after you took your image of your tissue section, uh, that will be useful later on for downstream analysis. The inter interesting part is this PR mobilization step where uh, you have a bunch of uh, barcodes that are on the slide. Uh, and so once you put your tissue section on the slide, all the barcodes will enter vertically into your tissue and target your whole transcriptome. And so in those barcodes, you will have the information, um, the spatial location of those barcodes. And so later on, when you sequence everything, um, when you do your synthesis and, and, and et cetera, you will be able to retrieve those uh, spatial location of your uh, gene expression data. Um, so I guess I'll use also this slide to uh, give credit to people uh, here that really did a great job. So we have a, we actually have a neural bank core here at the University of Iowa, where Queen Aline did a, an amazing job preparing the, the samples. Um, and then she passed that on to our genomic core, who also did, um, as always, a great job uh, sequencing everything and giving us uh, a very clean uh, data set. And so my job pretty much was to analyze this very interesting data set. Um, so how does it look in terms of, in terms of results? Um, so in A here, I show you the, the staining. So you take uh, an image of your tissue section. Um, and so you can already see some structure on, on your brain. Um, you can see the hippocampus over here with the CA1 on the top and the dentate gyrus as a V shape over here. And so, like I said, on this tissue section, you have a bunch of different spots that you can see in B. Um, and each spot has barcodes that target the whole transcriptome. So you will be able to compute a transcriptomic signature for each spot. And so just like in single cell, the spots that have the same, uh, that have a similar uh, transcriptomic signature will be clustered together, or here will be colored, the, will have the same color. Um, and so you can already start to see some different regions of the brain that have the same color. Um, and if you put uh, an atlas, a mouse atlas on the right, you can see that the, the transcriptomic signature of each spot in B recapitulated really well the, the, brain, and, the brain anatomy of, the, of this atlas. Uh, and that was something really, really exciting to see that uh, just by looking at those uh, 2,000 or 3,000 most viable genes in each spot, we were able to, to, uh, to map the, those different brain regions very, very easily. Um, and so in green, for example, here we have the hippocampus, um, we have the neocortex at the top, we have the fiber track in yellow here around the, the hippocampus. Uh, in lighter green, we have the thalamus, and in, under the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus, for example. Um, and so just like that, I was able to subset my data set um, into all those different brain regions, uh, because my, my goal was to look at gene expression changes after sleep deprivation, in those different brain regions uh, individually. Um, something else you can do also is, um, like I said, it's, it's very similar to a single cell in a sick data set. And so you can do a UMAP plot again, uh, but this time each dot is not a cell, but a, a spot of, your, of the slide. Um, and so the, again, if the spots have a similar signature, they will, they will be clustered together. You can also compute uh, the biomarkers of your specific uh, uh, specific clusters. Um, and that's actually what they, they use in this paper that I previously introduced, where um, they use the specific biomarkers on, the, on their tissue section to identify specific macro environment of the, of the tumor. So how does it look um, on, on PowerTech? That's, uh, that's what I've been mostly using for this data analysis um, and it's very user-friendly. Um, and I know um, Sean will go more in detail after me, um, but basically you start with your uh, single cell matrix at the beginning, which is uh, the direct output of the Phoenix Genomics uh, pipeline called uh, Space Ranger. Um, so you get your matrix of gene expression data 
And the first step is to annotate this uh, matrix with your tissue image, uh, which is just uh, using the barcode information to overlay your gene expression data on your tissue section. Um, then you have like classical steps of filtering and normalizing. Um, I, uh, I actually correct for batch effect because we, we actually did this experiment twice. We started with eight mice uh, and it worked so well that we decided to do it again to have uh, more power. Um, so we had two batches of vision uh, data to combine, um, but also to correct for batch effect. And after you can do some different analysis, like um, different short gene expression analysis and filter your gene list, uh, for example. Um, but what's interesting here is like each circle is a is is a, a node, uh, uh, an analysis node, and so at any moment you can choose to use another branch for a different type of analysis if you want to try something else. Um, and that's exactly what I've done here. After I annotated my images, I went and I tried uh, another. Um, normalization uh, algorithm. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring you uh, here. Um, if, we, if we take an overview of the whole workflow with all those different nodes at the end, which is one for each uh, brain region, um, the main take home message I want you guys to take from this is that from what I've tried with those type of tool and data, um, the, the, I first log uh, transform my, uh, my data, which is a very classical and normal uh, um, normalization step that we always do in bulk analytic and single cell analytic um, that is very suitable for gene expression um, uh, analysis down, down the line. Uh, but there's a new algorithm that came up uh, more recently that's called SE transform um, for, um, and for the, the grave-based clustering, uh, meaning that this algorithm actually performed better than the log transform in terms of finding the different uh, trans transcriptomic signatures of each spot or each cell, if it's a single cell analysis data. Um, and because it's able to find uh, better the signatures, because it, it, kind of, it kind of do a better job in the way that even the very small changes in signature, this algorithm will be able to detect. But because it's able to find very small differences, if you keep this algorithm to do differential gene expression analysis, you will have very, very big fold changes. And when I say very big fold changes, it will be like tenth, like thousands or tens of thousands of fold change, um, which is a, a lot. Um, and it's if, if you do that, then it's a bit hard to compare your data set and your gene expression data with other, uh, other data set, like a classic Vulcan music, for example. Um, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, you will have both algorithms will give you the same um, kind of uh, uh, hits, uh, same genes significantly affected. It's just like the, the value uh, will be way, way bigger with the SE transform algorithm. So that's why here in Partech workflow, the, 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 the neat thing here is I, I, I can do two branches in the same time and identify my clusters with SE transform, but then transfer the labels of those clusters back to my log transform data set. And so in the end, I have very nice cluster identified that have a log transform data set um, to be able to perform the differential gene expression analysis in specific clusters. So in terms of results, how do, what do we have? Um, so in, in, on the left, it's, this is a bar graph showing you the number of significant genes affected in each of those brain regions after slit deprivation. So comparing the eight slices that were sleep deprived versus the eight slices that were non sleep deprived. And we were actually surprised to see that the, actually the hypothalamus uh, comes in first place, uh, meaning that the, the hypothalamus is the brain regions um, transcriptionally most affected after sleep deprivation. Um, the hippocampus comes in, in, in right after in second place, but uh, we were actually surprised and, and excited to see that, well, maybe we shouldn't really focus that much on the hippocampus. Maybe we should look at other brain regions because apparently the hypothalamus seems to be um, the brain region the most affected in terms of number of genes significantly affected. But it gets really interesting when uh, on the right, we do this type of Venn diagram um, overlapping the gene list of uh, the, the first four brain regions. Um, so even though we do have a small overlap between each, brain, each of those four brain regions, the majority of the genes that are in, in those bold numbers at the, at the extremities of those Venn diagram, 
the majority of the genes affected after sleep deprivation is actually specific to this brain region, um, which is pretty much the, the, main, uh, the main result and the most important result I have so far for you today is that the sleep deprivation really impact gene expression, but those changes will, will change completely depending on the brain regions you are looking at. And actually, we can do the same uh, by splitting the genes that were down on the left and the genes that were up on the right. Um, and it's actually pr pretty funny to see that if we do that, uh, now the hippocampus comes first. Uh, because actually, the, if you look at the number of genes that are affected in this Venn diagram, the hippocampus has specifically 540 genes that are significantly down, but only 95 that are up meaning that the majority of the genes that are affected after C deprivation are actually down-related uh, in the hippocampus. But if you switch to an another brain regions, let's say the neocortex, it is mostly genes that are actually up-regulated. So this is why it's really important um, to be able to identify the different brain regions and separate them for the instrument analysis, because clearly we don't have the same genes that are affected uh, after, after C deprivation. So this is looking at uh, specific brain regions, but what if you want, what if, um, you want to go a little bit deeper, let's say a subregion of, of one of those brain regions? Well, you, you have like two options. The first option is um, like Jacqueline uh, showed previously, you can click on specific dots and you, actually, you, you can also do that on Partech if you want. You can click on specific dots on your tissue section and subset your data set based on the dots you selected. Um, it's pretty easy here for the hippocampus, for example, because CA1 is very well, uh, 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 appear uh, very well on the h &E staining. And so you can select CA1 dots in blue, um, and you can also select those dots in red for the dentage iris. Uh, but what if, um, what if the, 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 the cell types you want to look at or the subregions are a bit more harder to look at? Well, then you have to switch on what we call the deconvolution. And that step, I had to exit Partec. So take the output of what I've done in Partec workflow and do um, a little bit of analysis in the command line using the SORAD package. And so basically what, what is deconvolution is using a reference single cell RNA data set that is already analyzed and labeled and use the, the transcriptomic signatures of this data set to predict the setup composition on your tissue section. And so basically in my reference that I said, I had a cluster of CA1. I use this signature of CA1 cluster to ask on this slide here on the left, what are the dots that are composed of CA1 cells? Because in each dot here, you have between 10 and 20 cells. So you can have a bit of a mix of different cell types. Um, and actually the, the, the the algorithm did a really great job by identifying the CA1 cells at the very top here layer uh, and nowhere else in the brain. Like you can see some red dots here on the right, which is actually CA2 and CA3 uh, cells um, that is pretty similar to CA1, but it is still different. Um, and actually you can see that you have two different shades of, of red. So that, that's pretty good. Uh, but nowhere else in the brain, you can see those red dots uh, lighting up. Um, and should I say that the more red the dots become, the more confident we are that this dot is actually composed of this specific cell type. I've done the same for the dentigerous here in the middle. And you can do also the same with the oligodendrocytes, which actually maps really well the fiber tract uh, brain regions that I previously identified. Um, and actually makes sense because the fiber tract in the, in the brain is mostly composed of oligodendrocytes. So cool. Uh, so that's one way. Um, and so for this uh, data set, I decided to also look in the neocortex. Um, and so I wanted to find, um, I, was, I wanted to identify the different layers of the cortex. And so you can't really click on the dots for that because the layers are not very well separated on your, on your tissue section. It's not that easy to see. But if you do some deconvolution, then you using another uh, reference uh, single cell and seek data set, I was able to predict um, the different layers of the, of the cortex on this, um, on this tissue section. And so for example, here in A1, we have the layer two and three. 
Then we have the layer four in A2, we have the layer five in A3, and we have the layer six in A4. And so in A5 here is a, some, um, like an aggregation um, of those dots, of those red dots here on the left. And so I hope you can appreciate the, um, the, the very nice superposition of those different layers of the cortex that are uh, predicted by this uh, deconvolution algorithm. And so like I, before I just had the neocortex as one uh, brain region, but now I'm able to subset the neocortex into four different uh, cortical layers and do the same thing again, which is looking at different gene expression analysis. Um, and one thing I wanted to, to look at, uh, um, it, it was um, those, um, those genes that were really interesting in the lab that are um, some type of immediate genes. So they are known to be induced after learning or after sleep deprivation. And so they're extremely induced in the neocortex. As you can see here in, in, in the B figure, B1 and B2 are a sleep, sleep deprived um, slice. B3 and B4 are non sleep deprived. And uh, it's pretty clear the induction of this gene arc uh, at the top of the tissue section in, in the neocortex. And so the, the question I had was, well, is this, this induction of arc is uh, layer specific? And so in C here, um, I show you a heat map of um, ARC, for example, but also other uh, genes that are known to be induced in the same time as ARC. Um, and actually, we, I didn't really have a, a, a specific pattern of those genes in, in, in any specific layers. Really, it was, it was very much uh, and significantly induced across all different layers. Um, so that was, that was great to see that as a, as a control, but uh, also as a, as a uh, potential application uh, downstream of, uh, of the spatial transcriptomic data analysis. And again, we can do the same thing as I previously showed for the specific brain region, but this time with uh, specific cortical layers. Um, and this, we have the same conclusion again, is that the genes, must, the majority of the genes that are affected after seed deprivation in those specific cortical layers are actually specific to uh, to, each, to each layer. Um, you can see that, for, for example, in layer two and three, we have almost 600 genes that are upregulated here on the left, uh, but only 78 that are down. But if we switch to the, to the layer four, it's only six genes that are up, but 85 that are down. So again, depending the, la the critical layers you're looking at, the number of genes and the directionality or so of, of the genes uh, uh, completely change. So it's, it's really, I think with this, this uh, study and this project, we really need to be able to um, differentiate and identify those different brain regions and, and even subregions because it, apparently the transcriptomic changes are very, very different depending on the spatial location you're looking at. And so that's pretty much the two main uh, conclusions I want you to remember from this uh, presentation is first, you. Uh, we were able to identify the, um, the anatomy of the mouse brain just by using those transcriptional signatures of each spot. Um, and the second, uh, the second message is that the, in, in our case for sleep deprivation, um, it induces uh, specific transcriptomic changes um, that are really specific to each brain region. But if you focus on one brain region, or oh, sorry, on one brain region, for example, the cortex, it's also very specific to the cortical layers of the cortex. Um, and so, yeah, with that, um, there's a lot of people to thank. Um, obviously, my, uh, my mentor, Tay um, uh, spe Also, a special thank to Emily Walsh, who did um, the sleep, de the, who sleep deprived the mice. Um, Queen Aline, also Kevin from the, from the core, and also Sherwin, who was really, really helpful to teach me how to use Partech workflow for my data analysis. And with that, I'll take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, how did you interrogate control and sleep deprived brain for differential gene expression? Are they on the same block or did you interrogate two Visium data sets and then normalize them? Um, so uh, basically the, the nice thing with Partech is that you integrate your uh, data set at the very beginning of the workflow. And so all the slices were kind of, um, um, all the non-sleep deprived uh, slices were already together uh, and, and combined together in, in, into one, uh, one data set. And so it's kind of taking the average 
of, of all those eight slices and, and doing like uh, statistics and, and full changes uh, out of that. Got it, thank you. Any other questions pop up in the chat? Or in the q and I guess I should say. So, okay, there's a chat. S over controls a second series of slides. I'm not sure what that Kirby you're referring to. Can you evaluate if you want to um, unmute you if you would like? Uh, yeah, so the, um, yeah, yeah, I see the questions. Um, so basically the, the controls the non sleep the, we had we had 16 animals total. We had eight animals that were sleep deprived and eight that were non sleep deprived. And so from, uh, from each animal, we took one section of the brain. So we ended up by having eight sections that were kind of sleep deprived and eight sections that were non sleep deprived. Um, but all sections were integrated together on Partec um labeled differently based on the condition but they're all integrated together um, and so when you run differential gene expression analysis you compare the eight slice sleep deprived versus the eight slide non sleep deprived i don't know if it's answered the question um but Kirby, yeah. can you yeah can you let us know um <laughs> yes okay it answers the question <laughs> cool thank you great um does anyone else have a question for Jan? If not, you can post it in the Q&A and Jan, if you're free to stick around. Um, yeah, of course, yeah. Can answer. Okay, great. So I'll bring on Shawin next um, from Partex. Shawin, you can go ahead and uh, get started, but Shawin's gonna give a nice overview of what Partex is, um, how you can incorporate it with Visium, and then also do a live data tutorial. So Shawin, go ahead and uh, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Can you see my slide? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Um, next, I would like to show you how to analyze spatial gene expression data using point and click interface with the Partex flow. Yeah, first, I will give you a very brief introduction about what Partex flow is uh, for those of you who never use the flow, and then I will do a live demo of the software. Partic Flow is the browser-based application. The server can be hosted on a cloud or your local facility. As a Flow user, all you need is a browser-enabled device like your computer or your smartphone. Whenever you have um, uh, an account, you will have a username and login uh, a, a, and password. So you can use your Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Microsoft Edge. Partic Flow supports all kinds of single cell sequencing technology, like a single cell RNA-seq, cell surface protein, CRISPR perturbation, single cell ATAC-seq, VDJ, and the spatial transcriptome. For spatial transcri transcriptome, we do support both Visium and Xenium protocols. Also, you can integrate uh, data coming from different assays, like uh, RNA-seq plus protein, or RNA-seq plus ATAC-seq, or RNA-seq plus VDJ, uh, et cetera. Data can be imported at any stage. You can start your data from the raw sequencing data, like a BCL or FASTQ file, or you can start from processed data generated from other tools like a cell ranger, space ranger output, SARA object, H5AD, text file, TXT, CSV, TSV format. During your analysis, you can export your data at any stage. The exported file is industrial standard format. 
visualization will enable biologists to explore their data, um, explain their result, and present their discoveries. And Partech visualization is interactive. And the export images are publication quality. You can save them as PNG, PDF, or SVG format. Flow has a comprehensive and robust statistic tools needed for single cell data analysis, start from beginning all the way, take you to biological interpretation. You can QC the cells or genes at different levels. We have a variety of normalization methods. Dimension reduction allows you to visualize the data. You can use PCA, TSNE, and UMAP, et cetera. When you partition your data, you can use the clus clustering method options uh, like a graph-based clustering, k-means clustering, uh, hierarchical clustering, et cetera. When you classify your cell types, so we do have an automatic uh, cell type classification algorithm, which allows you to use a, an existing uh, classifiers from the database or you can build classifiers yourself using your own biomarkers. When you integrate data from different resources, you might have a big batch effect. We have a different options for you to do batch, batch correction, like a SARA integration, Harmony, and Partech batch remover. You can compare your different cell types or different treatment using a variety of inferential statistics um, to find the differentially expressed genes, like a parametric or non-parametric methods. Also, you might want to uh, analyze the number of cells across different cell types or uh, between different treatments. Uh, you can do that visually and statistically. For trajectory analysis, we, we implement a monocle two and a monocle three. And you can use a different uh, database like a CAG pathway, uh, gene ontology uh, gene set, or um, MCDB database to do pathway analysis and to further interpret the, your biology. Every step in your analysis is recorded. The audit trail allows you to track what was done, who did that, when that task was performed, how long it took, and how much uh, output data it generated. And the detailed information about the parameters used will uh, enable biologists to, to write their material and methods uh, sections in the manuscripts. Collaboration is very simple. If you want to share a project with your colleagues, all you need to do is type in their name and you can share it with, the, uh, with them at a different levels, like collaboration level, collaborator levels or viewer levels, which only allow them to visualize your plots and download the report you generated. And you can also easily share with a group of people. There's no file transfer needed. Whenever you need help, we are always there. We have tech support uh, all over the world. And there's a lot of educational resources. You can invoke that from Partech Flow, um, like a user guide, tutorials, and videos. Partech also provides discovery services. If you never use Partech Flow, please feel free to contact us to uh, get a free trial. And again, for today's viewers, you will have, we have a promotion code allowed you to have a one month free, free trial to Partech Flow. With that, I'm gonna do a live demo um, because the time limit, I will mainly focus on how to identify cell types um, using visualization. The data set is downloaded from 10X website. Um, there are two mouse sagittal brain samples. Um, they are processed using VZM spatial protocol. Uh, 6,000 spots in total. One sample is from anterior section. The other one is from posterior section. 
the analysis, I started from Space Ranger output. Uh, I imported the filtered count matrix file in the H5 format along with the image information. All right, I'm going to start my live demo. Uh, I will start by showing you the analysis results. This is my dashboard. The plot generated in each step during your analysis can be saved in one data viewer session. So you can visualize the data from different angles all together. In this data viewer on the left is the control panel. You can control all the plots. I identified seven different cell types in this project. So for each histology image, you can look at one at a time, but you can put all your samples side by side within one visualization. When you mouse over to a particular plot, there's in plot controls allows you, for example, I want to focus on this guy, I can maximize it. When you uh, uh, scroll your mouse wheel, you can zoom in, use your right mouse to pan it and the other direction to zoom out and reset. If you want to render in a plot, you can use those controls. Suppose in the style control, I can change the opacity of the genomic data information and then show more of the histology information. Every time, if you need help, we have an embedded help video in all the controls over here. So you can just click on it. Style can be invoked from the menu on the left here or by clicking the legend. Oh. So you learn the software as you do the analysis. For the image information, uh, you can change to use a different image, like high resolution, low resolution, uh, all the images generated from the Space Ranger. Or you can turn off the image, just look at the genomic profile information. Every time when you uh, do the analysis, if you make mistake, and we have undo and right click, will allow you to do a lot of, uh, um, uh, go back to several steps. Even the histology can be looked at uh, for each sample individually, but from the genomic profile, we can put all samples together and visualize them all together using a UMAP to look at the cluster information. And this is a 3D UMAP. If you press down your left mouse, you can drag it to rotate the plot, to look at the different angle. Also, if you go to the grouping, I can choose to split the plot by sample name. Now you can look at this, those two samples side by side with the same coordinates. And when you rotate that, they will be rotated together. After you identify the cell types, uh, when you compare different cell types, identify biomarkers, a dot plot is a very uh, nice way to display the biomarker genes. For example, in here, I show x-axis is the cell type, y-axis is the normalized gene expression. We can clearly see the TTR gene is a biomarker, positive biomarker of uh, epidermal cells. With this type of plot, uh, there's a lot you can change to different style. For example, you can overlay box whisker plot, turn off the violin, kind of move it over here, uh, or using violin, turn off the, the plot. So you can change to different styles. You can have multiple genes showing at the same time. Um, however, if you want to highlight your biomarker, multiple biomarkers for different cell types, uh, I think a bubble map is a more efficient way to help you tell the story. And this plot x-axis is each of my uh, seven cell type. Y-axis is the marker genes for, the, for that particular cell type. 
And the color more red means high expression of the gene within this group. And the size of the dot, uh, the dot also represented the percentage of the cells. They have a greater than zero expression for this gene. And you can easily transpose this plot, flip that into 90 degrees. After the cell type is classified, you want to look at the composition of the cell type uh, within a sample. So pie chart and the bar chart can help you tell that story. And in the pie chart, whenever you mouse over on a section, you will know in this hippocampus cells, we have uh, how many cells, and the percentage of the cells in this particular sample. However, you can easily combine them. So if I choose don't split my sample, this is all the uh, different cell type composition in the whole project um, between the two samples. And the uh, bar chart is telling you the similar story and from here, I can clearly see uh, I have more oligodendrocyte cells in my posterior samples compared to anterior samples. However, hippocampal cells is the opposite. In the bar chart, you can, this is showing the proportion. However, you can change that to absolute value by turn off the 100%. So we clearly see we have more cells in posterior samples compared to anterior samples. Also, you can change to different uh, styles. So I can arrange the bars horizontally instead of uh, stack. Depends on uh, what you want to highlight here. Um, after I identify the cell types, also I try to compare uh, the two samples to find the genes showing differential expression in a particular cell type. So I filter down to Purkinje cells and compare those two samples. Suppose you have a different treatment, and like uh, what Yan did, he has two different groups, so you can do this type of comparison too. And in this uh, volcano plot, each dot is a gene. X-axis is the log fold change, and the uh, Y-axis is the FDRP value. So the upper right and upper left corner of the cell uh, of the dots represent significant genes. And you can easily select the highlight of the genes. You want to look at who are those genes you know, by highlighting, using control to select them. Once you select the UCL criteria to select a certain uh, genes showing differential expression, a heat map is a very efficient way for you to uh, visualize your results. So within here, this is the cell level heat map. And uh, uh, Y axis is the uh, gene, or X axis is each cell. I group, um, I group them, look at those two samples in Purkinje cells. So the, I highlighted the blue color, the blue group of the genes is showing up regulation in the anterior samples compared to posterior samples. And the red group of the genes is showing the opposite. At the very end, I performed the GSEA to compare those two samples in Purkinje cells. And this is uh, one of the pathway on the top of my list. And you can visualize the enrichment score of this particular pathway. All the visualizations are interactive, which means if I want to select uh, certain cells, for example, in the oligodendrocyte uh, section in the bar chart, when I left a click on it, I selected the corresponding pie chart will be highlighted and the corresponding dot in posterior samples are highlighted and also the dot in my UMAP and dot plot, they are all highlighted. And if I use control to select another section, so this is another section highlighted. Also in the Purkinje cell heat map, if I want to select the Purkinje cells in the anterior samples, I can click over here. 
This is the anterior sample Purkinje cells. And the pie chart, the bar chart, and dot plot, and the UMAP2. If you uh, select a group of genes by clicking on the dendrogram, so the corresponding gene plot, which is in the uh, volcano plot, will be highlighted. And also the bubble map, uh, so you select at least one of this, uh, the gene over here too. This branch is highlighted too. So if you want to make a poster and uh, you can rearrange this plot um, by every plot that there is a handle, you can grab the handle and when you drag it, the blue is the drop target. So suppose I want to swap with those two or maybe this one, you can change this, uh, arrange to the place that you are happy with. And then later on, if you choose export image, it will export the whole session as a PNG, PDF or, or SVG format. All right, uh, next I want to show you how I get to here. So in the analysis pipeline, there's a breadcrumb and this is in the data viewer. We'll come back later. So you can click on the project name. I like to open that in a different tab. It depends on how you use the browser. Uh, as Yen showed you, the pipeline has two types of shapes. Circle represent the data, Rectangle represent action, the analysis on the data. So whenever you mouse over on a circle, you will have a feedback. So here I have a two samples, 6,000 cells or spots, 13,000 genes here. When you click on a circle, there's a context sensitive menu will pop up and allows you to do, uh, you can filter, you can do normalization, uh, do batch removing, do statistics, et cetera. So when you choose an action perform on the circle, um, after the task is finished, it will generate uh, another output circle. And the output can be the input for the downstream. As you go along the pipeline, uh, go along with your analysis, you build a pipeline. Of course, like Yan showed you, uh, within one data node, you might want to uh, run different tasks or even run the same task, um, but uh, uh, using different parameters. So that will branch it out with the different branch or different layers. Whenever you need help on the top, go to the help. We have a documentation, how to video, and you can always contact us. All right, so the whole analysis I did here, I started and imported the count matrix, the two samples, and I add histology image. Also, I performed the QAQC and filtered out some non-viable cells or filter out uh, some noise genes and perform normalization. And eventually I got to normalize the count uh, here. So after that, I perform the cell type classification. So mainly I want to show you how to do this part. Um, when I do this part, I uh, analyze each sample individually. Um, Partec, you have one button click, will go through each sample separately. So you visualize the UMAP or TSNI on each sample separately. And also you perform a cluster on each sample separately. The advantage is that uh, for each sample, you can match with your histology. And also, you don't need to worry about batch effect. You have a higher resolution when you visualize the data. After that, you can combine them to look at the UMAP for all samples together uh, and then perform a differential analysis. All right, so let's take a look at how to identify the cell type based on the histology, based on statistics, visualization, and also our biomarker gene expression, the biology, okay? Um, I like to, uh, every circle, when you click on it, you can open that as a report. So I'm gonna start from the histology uh, information. When you open this histology data node, it will open a data viewer. So the data viewer will display the uh, histology image of all your spots. 
And now I want to overlay my graph based cluster information. So if I click on get data, um, I, if you don't know how to use that, again, watch the help video. So I will search for my graph based um, graph based uh, uh, report data nodes. Whenever you mouse over it, you can see the minimap where the data node in your pipeline. When you click on this data node, you will see the content of the data node. It contains the graph-based annotation. So when you see the green background, that means you can drag this uh, annotation, this item. And when you drag it, the blue again is the drop target. You can put it on the axis or you can color it. And every time when you use an information, we have recently used all the variables, so you can easily search for that. Okay, so in this graph-based uh, annotation, um, you see two numbers. The first number is the sample ID, is the sample number one. And the dot after that is the cl cluster annotation for this particular sample. If you want to look at another sample, you go to axis and choose the other sample is automatically colored. If you want to look at both samples together, within the control, this um, button is called a duplicate plot. Drag it, you can drop it to different places. I put it to the left. And this, this is the same plot, but for this one is highlighted right now. When you see a thick border, that means it's highlighted. So the highlighted one, I want to look at the anterior to so look at the both images side by side. At the same time, I want to look at the UMAP on a cluster based on the gene expression profile only and to look at each sample separately. So now I can grab, go to my, uh, the information, what information you want to use to generate the plot. I look for my UMAP data node. So this UMAP, I calculated on each sample separately. So this data node, I'm gonna grab the, this data node and put it to the location, okay? Put on the top. And what type of plot you want to make, 2D or 3D? I want to look at 3D scatter plots. And then I want to duplicate this guy. For this highlighted one, let me look at the posterior. Now, um, you can see the coordinates, they are different because of the calculated separate lane. If I want to use my graph-based annotation to color code the UMAP, instead of go to the get data, you can use the legend from other plots. So see here is the green color, every green color, you can drag it. I'm gonna drop it right here. And this guy, I drop it right here. It will be colored correspondingly. So on the left side, I have my, my anterior sa samples, right side is posterior samples, but they are from different angle. Okay. Um, sometimes if you want to configure all the plots, you can use control to select left click to select the, all the plots and you can render them all together. So suppose I want to make the uh, dot sides bigger. You can make them big or make them small. And you can type in, I want to use two pixels to uh, draw the plots. You can leave all the plots up there during your analysis if you have a big uh, screen. Um, but for me, uh, I like to focus on one sample at a time. Uh, like what I said, you will have a high resolution and also uh, you don't have to worry about a batch effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and close all the other plots. I want to focus on the posterior samples. Use the histology image, overlay my gene expression, the biology uh, information on the data to give a meaningful classifier all the, the clusters here. 
So when we generate a, a graph-based clustering, we also calculate the biomarkers for each cluster. Um, the biomarkers is a positive biomarkers, means they are high expression genes in that particular uh, cluster compared to the others. So I'm gonna bring in the biomarker table now. So go to get data, search for my biomarker table right here, uh, put to the bottom. You can only draw a table for this data node. And this one uh, is anterior sample. Again, I want to change that to posterior. So different sample, they have a different table. Maximize this plot. Uh, in the data viewer, we only give you the top 25 uh, genes. So they are ranked based on the fold change. But if you click uh, over here, export to table data, you can download this as a text file. Um, uh, you can see more genes. We give you both the gene name and ensemble ID for you to search. So based on this, I can clearly see, um, if, you know, if you look at your familiar biomarkers, like in cluster one, PLP1, MBP, MOBP, they are biomarkers for oligodendrocytes. So we can use the gene expression to color the plot, but I want to keep the cluster coloring too. Let me just duplicate this plot. And this one is a graph-based annotation. And this one, you can drag this gene. Again, this is a green color. We drag it. High expression is darker blue. So we can clearly see this gene have a high expression in the sections corresponding to the cluster one, which is darker or green over here. You can use another gene to color. You can use both genes to color. So if you want to use multiple genes to color the plot at the same time, you drag this gene and drop it into this RGB, those three uh, color panel. So here, PLP1, I use red color. MBP, I want to use, uh, I'm sorry, the previous one I used green color. This one is used red color. Um, the yellow means double positive. If I choose another gene and drop it to the blue channel, white is a triple positive. So if you say, I have more than three genes, how can I uh, annotate a list of genes on the plot? If that is the case, you need to make a gene list. On Partec website, we distributed some biomarker genes based on some published papers. Uh, on certain cell types, or you can go to different websites to download the marker genes for your uh, cell type, uh, or you can manually make a cell type, uh, a gene list yourself. It's very simple. It's just a, a list of gene names. So once you have the gene name, you can go to style and go to color. This time I want to use a feature list. Feature means measurement. It can be gene or protein of the measurement, okay? Feature list, I will choose my gene list. Oligodendrocyte gene list is from a particular paper. There are 36 genes in this list. And when you color that, you can choose using the total count or use a mean or maximum or minimum or different uh, metric uh, to color code the, the cells. So based on all the different perspectives, I'm pretty confident that cluster one in a posterior sample is oligodendrocyte. And I will classify that as oligodendrocyte now um, by go to select and filter. And I want to base on uh, the graph based annotation. So I can drag this legend. You can also drop to the criteria. Uh, the selection criteria dialog. And we can see the sample one is disabled because we, this, uh, uh, we didn't display sample one. In sample two, if I select cluster one, they will be highlighted. And you can, uh, once you select, there are 1268 cells selected or spots selected. 
you can filter, include, and focus only on those 1,200 cells and do further analysis. Or clear the filter. Once I selected, I don't want to filter, I want to classify them. So you go to you go to classify, classify selection. Give a name. Oligodendrocytes. So this is one cluster. And now I'm going to show you a different way to select the cells to cluster a different cell type. For example, I see cluster three, there are some familiar genes like a CAR8, PPP1, R17, or marker genes for Purkinje cells. Let me just color code on that. I can make it bigger. And then now we can see there is a, a high expression in this area, right, for this particular gene. And this time, I'm gonna use the gene expression to specify my criteria. Let me close this. I'm gonna drag this gene and drop it to specify my criteria. This gene expression is from zero to um, almost 13. This is normalized count. You can use this sliding bar to slide that, to select the cells that they have a high expression of the genes. As I slide in the bar, you can see, you know, all the cells that are highlighted over there. Uh, you're gonna make a cutoff here, okay? You can manually type in the cutoff. Suppose I want to be a little bit more permissive, but let me use a seven. So there are 808 cells selected. But one gene is not enough. I can use multiple genes. Now let me drag this gene, another marker gene, put it over here. And this gene is from zero to 11. Again, I will select, um, this gene expression has to be greater suppose, than six. So the operation of those two genes is an end operation, which means that there's a 546 cells or spots, they meet both criteria. Suppose uh, you know there's marker gene, but you don't see that in the table because we only see 25 genes here. What you can do is you can search from like a, my normalized data node, which this data node containing all 13,000 genes after my cleaning up. So click on this data node, search for, I know the CALB1 is a biomarker per, for Purkinje cells. Uh, sorry, I ex accidentally closed my selection. Okay, so here, let me see. search for CELB1 and drag it, drop it right here. Okay, and now for this gene, I want to use the high expression, and you know, I suppose using uh, seven. I got 519 cells selected. However, like what Yan did, you can also manually select cells. So let me just make the dot a little bit bigger so I can easily grab that. If I see um, those cells, I don't agree that they are Purkinje cells or I want to include some more cells, what you can do is you can press your control key and then click on the spot to, oh, sorry, to select or uh, select or deselect. You can make it much bigger so you can easily grab on it. So you can see the numbers changing, right? Or I want to include more cells. So you're gonna combine with um, the uh, cells selected by certain rules using statistics, um, or you can manually you know, uh, make your decision to select cells. If you are happy with this 519 cells, that they are Purkinje cells, I will classify, classify selection. Whenever you see a yellow uh, message, that means some cells are already classified as oligodendrocyte, but now I want to call that uh, Purkinje cells. The later label will overwrite the previous one.
All right, so you're gonna continue um, analyze using you know, the techniques to analyze the, of the rest of the cell type. Once you finished with the sample one, I'm gonna go to sample two. So I switch to my anterior sample in the plot and also go to the table. If I, you can close that or, uh, or re-invoke that or you just uh, you know, change it. Suppose you want to take a break. We can save this session. I'm gonna save it. I will call that analysis in process. And then you can exit here and exit Partech flow. And next time when you uh, come back to flow, go to login to this uh, project and go to your data viewer and do your saved session, they're all here. Now click on it, you will pick it up on where you left off. So the previous classification, they are still here. And now if I, um, based on the um, biomarker information, for example, I see cluster four, uh, let me just color code that. I could cluster four in the green over here uh, is really Purkinje cells. So I will show you how to combine the information. Uh, let's see, we go to selection. And uh, again, I will choose criteria. Let me just remove all the, oh, when you specify criteria, there's no limitation on the formula you want to build. You can use as many genes as you want. You can use positive biomarker genes or negative biomarker genes, okay? So here I want to use a completely different criteria um, based on sample one graph based uh, clustering and select a cluster four. So now, there are 337, uh, 73 cells selected. And previously I have uh, 1241 cells identified as Purkinje cells. So now if I click classify selection, I will call the same name by uh, selecting the, the label. Watch this number. It will be automatically merged. So even you analyze each sample individually, all the information will be combined for all your samples um, at the very end. So once you finish all your samples, all the cell types, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna click on apply classification because all this information right now is only in the visualization, not in your pipeline yet. So once you click apply cell type, give a name, you know, just call that, uh, you know, my cell type, or you can call that version one, or, you know, you might want to do multiple versions. After you click run, this information will be populated to your pipeline. So if I go back to my pipeline and every data node will be able to contain that information. So here, um, I performed the UMAP on all the two samples together. And if you open the UMAP, like what I showed you earlier, and this is a 6,000 cells, and I'm gonna color use my new uh, cell type. And uh, you can use the different shape, represent a different sample. Uh, or the size of the dot to represent, uh, I only have a di two different sample, but you can use a different uh, uh, shape, size, color, rendering your plot, or you can separate them to different plots. Okay, so um, the next step, once the cell type is identified, uh, you probably want to do the comparison. So I can go back to my normalized count and perform differential analysis and under statistics. We have all kinds of options. I would say your statistical method to chose should be based on the normalization method you use. It should go hand in hand. And I use log normal for the normalization 
And I would recommend you to use either hurdle model uh, or ANOVA. But no matter what, the dialogue, they are very much the same. So if you click on the next, you will choose what you want to compare. Suppose I have uh, my sample. Here, I only have a sample, but if you have a treatment, a gender, age, a time point, uh, you will see all those information. So you can add the factor, add an interaction to build your model. Next, you can select what you want to compare. And you can compare, you know, anterior Purkinje cells versus Purkinje cells in posterior sample. Or you can compare um, in my per anterior Purkinje cells, which gene are different uh, from the anterior Purkinje cells. So all the combinations, all the questions um, typically will be answered based on each comparison. So you click finish, that will generate a statistical report. However, on the other hand, I like to clean up the data. What I did is after you identify the cell type, I want to focus on one particular cell type, filter only in um, the cells in Purkinje group. So that way the downstream is more straightforward uh, and also is uh, um, easier, less noise to explain. So I filter down to a certain cell type and perform a differential analysis. And the results table will look like this, 13,000 genes. And this table containing um, all uh, the comparisons of uh, anterior versus posterior, p-value, FDR p-value, fold change, mean of those two groups. And Partech always give you linear fold change, even your data is in the log space, we translate it to linear space. But if you are comfortable with the log space, you can add to the log ratio. And some people call that log fold change, it's the same similar thing. You can add some other information, other annotation of the gene. Um, the volcano plot is what I showed you earlier, invoked from here, and the dot plot is invoked from here. Also on the left side, you can specify your criteria to filter your genes. Suppose I want to use FDR p-value is less than 0.01 uh, and a fold change, I want to use a two-fold or a five-fold you know, specify your criteria. Every time when you specify criteria, we, we always give you the feedback and see how many genes you really want to generate for the downstream so you can adjust your uh, cutoff. So once you're happy with this, click on generate a filtered data node. It will give you um, another data node. This is a filtered data, uh, gene list. And from here, I perform the heat map at a cell level I showed you earlier. And also you perform enrichment analysis. Also at the normalized count, I performed the GSEA to compare the two samples at the pathway level. So um, if you open the GSCA results, um, we saw the profile table and uh, this is the, uh, the result table. So here you invoke the profile or you can click on the pathway name to look at the gene network. All the colored genes, um, they represent full change by default, but you can use other statistics. You can change the color over here um, and click on a gene that will take you to the CAC database. All right, uh, with that, I would like to conclude uh, my uh, presentation. So I showed you how to in, uh, import the start from account matrix. We add a histology image um, and uh, analyze uh, the data for each sample, classify the cell type, and visualize all the samples together and to compare the data using differential uh, statistics at a gene level and at pathway level. Again, whenever you need help, uh, go to help documentation. And we have a lot of uh, training videos, tutorials, user guide, and you can type in the name you want to search for a certain chapter. 
Also, uh, we have the how-to video, all the embedded uh, videos. This is the page for all of them. Um, they are very short. You can see a few minutes, and you can learn the software from here, too. And also, feel free to contact us. This is the website, and um, email us. So we'll be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one web meeting with you. Um, again, if you never use Partec Flow, and today we have a promotion uh, going on, contact us to get a one month free trial of the software. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Jowen. And you know, thanks for your time and doing the walkthrough. We do have questions in the chat. I do have to say at 10X, we love Partech. You know, you guys are really supportive of our end users. And the interface is really easy to use and you guys just provide exceptional support. So, you know, we, we love partnering with you guys on, on stuff like this. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read through the questions um, and go through it. The first one, you pretty much answered in the beginning, but I think it would just be helpful to review again. So can I analyze data with Partech Flow instead of R? So just completely bypassing R Studio. Right. Yeah, so in Partech Flow, they are all point click. You don't need to write a script. Yeah. So, yep. All right. Is it possible to see the p value of the differences? Uh, uh, yeah. When you perform a differential analysis, the result you will have uh, the p value. Yeah, that's what the inferential statistics are about. Perfect. Mm -hmm. The next question is in the heat map, where can we see the color code scale? Oh, uh, for all the detailed information, I'll be happy to um, uh, answer that if I didn't answer it here. So you click on the heat map control and watch this video. It will show you how to uh, change the color, et cetera. Perfect. All right. Is there a way to get the spots to scale on the histology image um, using Partech? Um, uh, the 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 spot scale. Oh, currently, um, we, we're working on it. Yeah, currently we don't display the scale. Um, but we're working on it to give you more information about the histology spot. Got it. Um, is there a way to rank your marker genes by p values instead of full change in Partech? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can generate biomarkers yourself and. You know, you can download the table and rank it in different ways. So basically, the biomarker calculation is using t-test under the hood, and we compare every cluster versus non this cluster. Uh, we use a p-value to set the cutoff, and the fold change use 1.5. But you can change when you compute the biomarker manually. Yes. OK, great. Um, another question, is there a way to measure how optimal the clustering is other than visual or like sanity checks from the graph-based or k-means clustering, for example, using like a silhouette score? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Um, so we can uh, talk about uh, uh, some other algorithm to estimate the cluster information, you know, offline. Maybe there are more algorithms out there we can um, do some research on that. Okay, great. Um, and then from the same person, how do you group analysis nodes together on the workflow? Oh. Uh, so here, um, so suppose that this is a pipeline. If it's too long, you just right click on a circle and then you can change color, you can collapse the task. And that's how I did it. So you just Great. choose, uh, you know, uh, if I just call, give a name and then group them to make it look clean. And when you double click on it, uh, you will see the, uh, you know, if you double click, you will see the details. Great, thank you. And one last question here. How do you do a uh, trajectory analysis? Uh, we do have, if you go to trajectory, we have a mon uh, actually we have a monocle two, monocle three, and uh, for this server, I didn't turn on monocle two. Um, yeah, so just one button click, click on it, it will perform the, uh, the analysis. And also you can go to our documentation and search for trajectory. So that's how you search for a certain chapter 
And here we have a detailed information on how to do Monocle 2, what that means, and Monocle 3, et cetera. Great. Um, all right, so that probably answered all the questions in the chat. We can probably give everyone like a minute more if you, if anyone else has a question. Uh, but this is really fantastic. And Jan, uh, if you're still there as well, I think you're on. Yay, Jan. And thank you so much for your time as well. You know, I think it really gives insights and gives people more ideas of like what they can do with Visium and deconvolution methods and as well as using Partech, right? So it was a really great talk today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Right. Thank you, Jacqueline, and thanks everybody for your time. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it looks like, nope, that's just a, okay, chat, we're good. All right, everyone, well, thanks so much. I'll give everyone three minutes back of their day. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. And happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs>